Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all and welcome to worship this time together. We've come to celebrate and celebrate God, enjoy life, and, and enjoy one another here in our worship. Good to be together. Well, let's begin with prayer. God, our Creator, Jesus, our Lord, Holy Spirit, our God. Together, three in one, you are God. You are the one who made us, who saves us, who is always with us. We come together to worship you, not just with our lips, although we certainly love to sing your praise and, and call upon your name, but we also worship you with our, with our minds, with our hearts, with our bodies. May all that we do today and all this week bring you honor and glory. Amen. Let's pretend that you are my boss and I work for you. And you like being the boss, ordering people around. And so you say to me, Bruce, get me a drink. And I'm your servant. And so I bring you a glass of water. And you say, not that, you fool. I want a juice. And then you say, my legs are tired. I need a foot rest. Hey, kneel in front of you so I can put my feet up on top of you. Now picture a different kind of boss, one who leads by example. So um, I need to move those boxes from here over to there. Will you help me, please? And when you're halfway done the job, the boss says, wow, it's ever hot. Maybe we should take a break. I'm going to have a glass of water. Would you like to have some? Now, which type of boss would you like to work for? I expect we would all say the second guy. And I expect that's the kind of person that we would like to be ourselves if we were in that position to be a boss. Well, the reason I'm describing all this is that Jesus was like that. Even though he's in charge, he doesn't boss people around. Whatever Jesus asks us to do is something that he himself is willing to do. And I'll talk about that more in my message. But for now, let us know this, that we can trust Jesus with our lives, with everything. So let's pray. And Lord Jesus, thank you that we can trust you. I heard in the news recently that some insurance companies have refused to pay customers for business losses due to the pandemic, even though those businesses specifically paid extra for pandemic coverage. I hear about wealthy people who marry, but first have their lawyers draw up detailed prenuptial agreements in case they divorce. This past week, I even heard weather forecasts for rain that never happened. There is so much in this world that we cannot trust, we cannot depend upon, but we can trust you. Now that doesn't mean that things always turn out the way we want. Sometimes terrible things happen and our faith is shaken to the core. Has God abandoned us? We wonder, where is God? Is there God? And at times like that, we turn to the Bible. We read in the Psalms so many prayers which cry out to you in distress. We read in the New Testament how believers were imprisoned and tortured for their faith. We read in the Gospels how the Son of God was tortured and killed. And so we know that we are not alone in our troubles. We may not understand the why, but we know the who. We can come to you in prayer and pour out our hearts to you. Even though there are troubles, Lord, help us. Help us to also recognize our blessings and to give you thanks. And even more, help us so that we can be a blessing to others. So we pray not just for, us, for ourselves, but for others as well. And thinking today especially about Alan and Nancy Dryden. They've shared life and shared love for, for all these many years. But now it's at the point where Nancy doesn't even recognize Alan. And that's heartbreaking. 
I pray, God, for, for you to be with them and, and hold them in your arms and just let them know that they are loved. We pray for Joan Moorcroft and also for Monty. What affects one affects both. We pray for Alex and mom and dad, Kate and Dave. Help him with, with his health, the whole family. We pray for Ellen, Ellen Jones. She's coming to the end. God be with her and be with Barb and with the whole family. Give them your peace day by day. We pray for Linda and Gerald Grills. Ask God for your, your strength for them day by day. And for Bonnie Dale. Yes, Lord. Be their strength. All this we bring to you in Jesus' name. And I invite us all now to join together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I see on the desk here, people have brought in their offering envelopes, and some of you are, are sending, them, sending them in the mail, or some of you are using the online offering system that is on the website. But here, here's my offering, so I, I just give this as, as one of all of us as we give our offerings to God. Mm -hmm. God, we bring to you our offerings. You've done so much and given so much. We want to contribute our part for your kingdom. Use these gifts and use us as a living sacrifice for your work and your glory. Amen. <clears throat> well, Judy is going to um, lead us in our Bible reading. Okay, this reading is from the Gospel of John 13, verses 1 to 17. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to his Father. Having loved his own who were here in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Oh, then, Lord, Peter replied, Not just but my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, 
have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Amen. Thank you, Judy. Let's pray. <clears throat> so Lord, as we open the scriptures, we open ourselves to you. I ask you to come in and fill all of us with your Holy Spirit. Draw us closer to yourself so that we would love you more dearly, know you more clearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. So we started looking last week at the central theme of Jesus' message, the kingdom of God. And we saw that the kingdom exists wherever people follow Jesus as their king, that is, they obey him. We see this in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. A creed is a statement of faith. So sometimes in our worship services, we say together one of the creeds of the church, the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or the you know, Church Creed. One of the earliest creeds of the Christian church is found in Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans 10, verse 9. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The heart of that creed is just three words. Jesus is Lord. The reason this creed was so important is that it declared that Jesus is the supreme ruler. You see, in those days, the sign of allegiance to the Roman Empire was to say, Caesar is Lord. But the Christians refused to do that. They declared that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. But, and this is a big but, it's not enough to simply say that Jesus is Lord. We have to live it out day to day. This is what Jesus said himself in Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. When the judgment day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name we spoke God's message. And by your name we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. So I'll say it again. We are part of the kingdom of God when our lives are based on following Jesus. I'm going to go down a little side trail here and talk about government. What's the best kind of government? Many people would say, and you might say it as well, democracy, where people get to vote on who will govern them. And that sounds quite reasonable. Although the clowns and chaos we often see in the House of Commons in Ottawa makes me wonder about that. I believe there's actually a better system of government than democracy. The very best form of government is to have a king or a queen who is just and kind. But the problem with that is that we live in a sinful fallen world or where nobody is perfect, not even monarchs. And so instead of having just and kind kings and queens, we have nations where dictators rule as greedy and vicious tyrants looting the wealth of the country for themselves, crushing any opposition with brutal violence. That's why Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried. But I'll say it again. The best form of government is a benevolent dictator, a king or a queen who is humble and generous and loving and just, and kind, sacrificial, altogether good, concerned more for the people than for him or herself. Jesus is that 
kind of king. Jesus is the kind of king who would willingly leave behind his throne and instead be born in a stable. He would leave behind the riches and glory of heaven to live in poverty and humility. He left behind the place where he was worshipped, trading that in so that he could be mocked and mistreated and murdered. Jesus is the kind of king who cares more for others than for himself. Jesus is a king whom we can trust. I want to explore that a bit more as to just what kind of a king is Jesus? Because see, some people are afraid of making a commitment to Jesus. They're afraid of Jesus. They think that he will be a, a tyrant boss. Something like that boss I described earlier on, the one who wants to use me as a footstool. Uh, they think that Jesus will make unreasonable and impossible demands. Well, let's look at the life of Jesus and see what kind of a boss he was on earth, that will tell us what kind of a king he is today. And so in John 13, verse 3, we read, Jesus knew that the Father had given him complete power. He knew that he had come from God and was going to God. Now imagine that you're in that position. You have complete power. You can do anything you want. You can have anything you desire. What did Jesus do with his power? Well, let's continue reading the next few verses. So he rose from the table, took off his outer garment, and tied a towel around his waist. Then he poured some water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. Stop and think. Jesus is the Son of God. The universe is his to command. Legions of angels stand ready to answer his call. Yet what does he choose? To be a servant. His goal in life was to love and serve the people around him, ultimately giving his life for all. Jesus never asks us to do something that he would be unwilling to do himself. Rather than being a tyrant who bosses people around, Jesus is a Lord who leads by example. And his example is to love and serve one another. Fred Craddock, who's a preacher, spoke in a message about how we serve. This is what he said. To give my life for Christ appears glorious to pour myself out for others, to pay the ultimate price of martyrdom. I'll do it. I'm ready, Lord, to go out in a blaze of glory. We think giving our all to the Lord is like taking a $1,000 bill and laying it on the table. Here's my life, Lord. I'm giving it all. But the reality for most of us is that he sends us to the bank to change the $1,000 for quarters. We go through life putting 25 cents here and 50 cents there. We listen to the neighborhood kid telling us their troubles instead of saying, oh, get lost. We go to a committee meeting. We give a cup of water to a shaky old man in a nursing home. Usually, giving our life to Christ isn't glorious. It's done in all those little acts of love, 25 cents at a time. It would be easy to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder to live the Christian life little by little over the long haul. Thank you, Fred, for that. What kind of king is Jesus? It's the king who loves and serves others and calls us to follow his example. So I said a moment ago that some people are afraid of Jesus, afraid of what he's like. Another fear that many people have is that following Jesus will take all the fun out of life. But it's the very opposite that's true. It's when we reject God and rebel against his ways, that's when we get ourselves into misery. Following Jesus brings life and joy. John 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give life in all its focus. 
John 15, verses 10 and 11. Jesus said, When you obey me, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father, and I remain in his love. I have told you this so that you may be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Bertrand Russell, the famous British, British philosopher who died in 1970, might be one of those who was afraid of Jesus, afraid of what he commanded. He proclaimed himself to be an atheist and wrote a famous essay, Why I Am Not a Christian. As I said, his career was a professor of philosophy. He governed his life by reason and logic and wherever his search for truth led him. At least that's what he wrote in his books. Yet his private life showed a different kind of person. As a professor, he found an abundance of young female students who were willing to be sexual partners who would help their marks. Not surprisingly, he went through four marriages. Sounds more like he was on a search for pleasure than a search for truth. When Bertrand Russell died, he said that he was as, quote, as one without any hope or joy. Compare that to Malcolm Mugridge, also British, also lived much the same time. He was born 30, about 30 years later. Mugridge was an agnostic, also not believing in God, but at the age of 79, he became a Christian. He said he could resist all the great books and all the great sermons, but when he saw Mother Teresa in Calcutta with the poor, the outcast, he said, if this is it, I've got to have it. Mugridge trusted Jesus and found him to be the source of life. So Jesus is a king who loves and serves and who asks us to follow his example. It's a king who gives us joy and gives us life. So here's the next steps. First step, as usual, is to pray. And ask God to change your heart so that you become more like Jesus. Besides helping you to grow, that also makes it just more natural to follow Jesus. The second step is to follow Jesus' example of loving and serving others. Especially where there's no reward, no recognition, just the joy of giving love. Third step is to take a risk. Step outside your comfort zone. Do you, do you get this, this idea, this, this nudge that, that God is calling you to do something unusual, maybe maybe anything a little bit weird, as part of loving and serving others? <laughs> Go ahead, do it. Ah, just enjoy the life that Jesus calls us to. Well, that, that concludes our worship. We can stay and visit and enjoy talking with one another and sharing life. But when you do leave, finally, I really encourage you to, to watch the song that I put in the email, the one called Do Something. Because it, it, it's a song about, well, what we're just talking about, loving and serving others and actually doing it, not just talking about it. So God bless you all this week and may you be a blessing to others.